Welcome to Fashion Futurist Podcast. It's your host, Camila Sanders. And this season, we are discussing Africa. We're connecting with industry experts and individuals on the front lines to gain viable resources for your fashion journey. Together, we're working to take back fashion, shift power, shift economics, shift paradigms, and create a new sustainable ethical fashion system. Take a listen and let's accelerate fashion forward. And so how do we, how do we shift this? You mentioned like funding, you mentioned just, you know, really access to different markets, education, like how, how do we start to shift what is happening? And the reason why I asked this, and really the reason why this, this season is dedicated to Africa is because, like you said, there's so many resources, there's so many examples of what we call, you know, sustainability. And like you said, not necessarily going by seasons, but going by uh, what it, what is happening in your life at that time. There's so many examples of like luxury and quality clothing in Africa, right? And so mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, if we could get back to this, if we could you know, highlight what is happening and use that as an example, like how do we, and I know, you know, a lot of this has been centuries, right? (laughs) Of of, of work and colonialism. How do we start to shift that and move the needle? I I think the answer is in exactly what you just said, because all of these things came overnight, I think it will be naive to think that it's going to change overnight. I mean, if it's taken a global pandemic and Black Lives Matter to happen at the same time, as as unfortunate as both of these things are, you know, they had to happen. And that happened for a reason for the world to pay attention, for us all to be sat on our phones, you know, waiting in this pause um, for us to realize like, wow, we we need to have these conversations. But, you know, it's, it's like, it's been a detox of us having now saying so much and you know you and I you know came across each other through Clubhouse and Clubhouse wouldn't have been we wouldn't have had all these conversations if it wasn't for the hardship so the bad things that happen aren't all bad the idea is to say why why is it taken so long for this to happen why is the African woman not acknowledged in intellectual property you know being a curator You know, this aspect of being a curator now, it happens on art museums to fashion shows to, you know, makeup brands that everybody's got an artistic director, but the original artistic director is the African woman. And so how do we cause this shift is to center the black woman. And it's not because I'm talking to my fellow sister now that I say this, but, you know, I talk to in many rooms and I talk a lot as you've gathered but I'm talking to people who don't look anything like me and they want me to give them the answer and it's really hard not to be resentful of this conversation being you know male and pale and Yale for you know decades and decades but then they want to hire one or two or ten people just to tick diversity or inclusion or if Africa is is brought up now in conversations to do with you know, the way forward or, um, you know, the new world or, you know, it's just like, it sounds, it's too clinical. It needs to be organic. As much as I would love to believe in, you know, us meeting these goals, I think even the United Nations understand that it's not going to happen by 2030. Why? Because Africa has needed this for decades and if not centuries and if we can have a system that is bad like say for example the transatlantic state slavery for lack of a better example go on for 400 years before you know it's corrected then we can believe that this has been going on for a hell of a long time and we haven't noticed and so to put a stop clock or a, or a watch on it and say it has to stop by like why 2030? Because if we're listening to the global South, it should have happened yesterday, but nobody listens. No, when you look at all these floodings that are happening, if if they were happening in, in, in Basel or in London or in New York, God forbid, you know, the world would have paid attention, but because they're happening in Sudan, in Ghana, in Pakistan, 
and people do care. And there are millionaires and billionaires, and you know, we talked about money and funding, but throwing money at this is going to cause temporary solutions. The real solution is, is in having conversations with our neighbors and with our communities. For example, I don't listen to any foundation or NGO anymore, partly because I'm cynical about where the funding is coming from, partly because I'm cynical about who owns the data, partly because I know that someone is going to get an award or acknowledgement for doing this. So I'm more interested in the people having the real conversations when no one's looking. And I know that this will go out to your audience and I'm really proud to be part of your conversation. But to me now, I feel like I'm talking to you, which is why you know, it was never going to be like half an hour because we, this is something that both of us have been wanting to do for a while. But then, you know, when, when you have a meeting and you put it on Slack or, you know, or you have a campaign driven strategy and if you have a deadline, it's not you can't have a clinical solution to something that needs um, a holistic answer. So. Yeah, I guess it didn't come overnight. It's not going to go away overnight. Intention is very important because if we're doing this just to cover diversity, tick boxes, get access to funding, to look good, to look like, you know, now I look at the fashion walk and, you know, it's like, (laughs) I'll say something out loud that very few people will say. It's hard not to find a black model on a magazine cover anymore because I don't know about the the States, but in in the UK, it was like they discovered black women all of a sudden. And we were here all along. So why were we not pretty enough? No, we were here, but you overlooked us. So now you don't feel like overlooking us. Now we're pretty. Well, I felt pretty all along because my mom said so, because I see beauty in my daughter. So I don't need the West. I don't need Vogue to tell me that my features are acceptable or for a catwalk to say that we exist or for France to ban the hijab, but then sit back and watch the Iranians burn their headscarves. These are all fashion political issues. And I think it's naive to think that we can separate politics from fashion because it's about believing and and we petition for what we believe just like opening my wardrobe in the morning and I reach for you know a gray jumper instead of a a, a, um, a blue one I I that's what I feel I feel like wearing the gray one so why can I not feel what's happening in the global south it's because I, I've taken my my eye off the ball and I think we just need to just realize whilst we're choosing what we're choosing we're unchoosing something else I love what you just said while we're choosing what we're choosing we are choosing something else or when we're choosing what we're choosing and so that to me says that when I make a choice, whether it's to purchase something or to just interact with something or to communicate in a certain way, you are choosing to impact somebody else. You're choosing to impact the world, right? With your decisions. And that's every person. So that's your vote. That's your right. That's your, <laughs> exactly. That's your vote, right? So the but also at the same time, you you can choose not to choose by not consuming so much, by not voting for that political leader that, you know, that might give, for example, we live both of us in privileged countries, but when we go to vote for our next local mayor or president or prime minister, whatever, you know, it's not just what are you going to do for me and my community and my education and my student loans, debts, blah, blah, blah. We should also hold them to higher standards of what are you doing to other people? Because I promise you, most of the fashion industry has been left decimated because it can't flourish. It can't grow because of American and British 
foreign policy. And it's, you know, America gets to choose, you know, what country Sudan can trade with. You know, the UK can choose because of the Commonwealth, which countries we do business with. And I, I've seen this with my own eyes. I've seen, again, you know, in I work in Parliament as a, an independent for UK-Africa trade negotiations. And I sit there and, you know, I watch the way they have one contract for 54 countries and you, can, like, you can't give the same, you can't have the same policies. You can't have this cookie cutter thing system for everybody and then it's called UK Africa trade negotiations and they're like um let's start and I'm like no I I have a question and then rolling their eyes like okay the one black woman in the room has got a question you know and they look at me they're like okay Miss Ali what is your question I'm like why is it UK Africa trade negotiations why is it Africa UK is in the benefit of the United Kingdom and Africa is not a country <laughs> it's just just it's an education issue that we all have to look at the world we live in and the way we consume and the fashion that we say fashion in the way we do things literally as a mode yeah and I just want to acknowledge that it's so important from your point of view that you're in these conversations and, you know, it, it's not great that you're the only one that looks like you, you know, <laughs> that that is in these conversations. But it's, it's so important that you're bold and taking up space in those conversations. Oh, thank you. But, you know, I'll tell you something unusual is I get mistaken for African-American from the way I speak, because to Europe and Africa, the image of uh, the African American woman is this empowered woman of you know this notion of speaking up because of the plight of the civil rights movement and all the leaders. We've seen the African American woman take many firsts from the Serena Williams, the Beyonces, to Diana Ross, to Dr. Angelo. I could obviously go on and on and on for ten hours, but. To us, you are that power, you are that ability to take space. And so this notion of the seat at the table, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is this feels, it feels very American to talk like that in the Middle East and Africa, because they think that I got that from, I don't know, watching um, too much Oprah. <laughs> you know, it's it's now it's more it's more acceptable, but before it felt like it was a pioneering concept to not take, you know, that I'm supposed to not notice um, that there's nobody else that looks like me. I've sat in meetings with LVMH and they talked about how Jay-Z having a seat at the table is great for them. You know, obviously it's only about commercially, but for me, the true democracy is when, you know, Sean Carter can walk into a store in Paris with his black hoodie without anyone knowing that he's a billionaire or married to Beyonce and they can say good morning sir or you know uh, or Bond Street actually that's what they'll say good morning sir or Harrods and they just treat him well that is the respect that I'm looking for from my fashion industry for Africa, from Africa it's like don't be nice because of the commercial impact Pack that that man can bring you with the black culture that follows him. This is not an algorithm exercise. This is about people who have walked miles and journeys for them to be treated with respect. So don't open the door for him because he's a billionaire. Open the door for him because he's a human being. And, and that is something that is frankly too much to ask from the same people who are robbing us of our diamonds, of our history, of our pride and our freedom. It's not going to come from them. We have to find another way. We need these conglomerates to be Black-owned, Africa-owned. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, until Africa is a Black-owned business, there is no democracy for the ecosystem of the fashion industry or for any other system it's not designed for us and so Africa will get the leftovers it will get the secondhand clothes 
from, you know, the, the charity shops being dumped and polluting its rivers and the last white rhino dying and the world didn't notice. It's the Columbusing. The fashion industry is Columbusing Africa. And we've seen this before and we have to stop this now. And not because why Africa now, it's a matter of why is it, why has it never been about Africa? That's my question. Right. I was about to ask a question and you, you answered it because you, you said before, you know, like, I don't need Vogue. I didn't need Vogue to tell me that I was pretty. Right. And, you know, walking in these stores and, and are we even being accepted and being the only seat at the table? You know, some people say, well, you know, create your own table. (laughs) We don't need a seat at the table. And I think that that that's so important to recognize is that we can no longer try to push into these different um, areas. Like you said, we need to start building things ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the Europeans will have African-Americans think that I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe that's something we're going to have another conversation about another day. What is it about American culture that thinks that Europeans have this as a secret source? Like they think that, you know, there is something about Europe. And I think that's part of the education system, that the accents or the way things are, that it's I don't know what it is, but, you know, no one is really explaining enough to America that it can all be done in house. I I think, again, going back to the business model of of the example of Kanye and and Gap, that someone should have told him that his hoodies, he shouldn't want them to be $20. If Gap sells them for him for $20, then the person making them with this business model is probably being paid 50 cents. And they aren't being paid at the moment as it is. It it was a bad fit from the beginning because his understanding, his perception of how to grow something for the community, and it was with every intention, I understand his vision of doing something for for the people. That only comes from when you, you work with your community. Again, going back to Ubuntu, you can't have something being imported from Southeast Asia and it's selling for $20 or $19, that is impossible. But they took him on and they used the brand that is Kanye West to save a name called Gap that was, frankly, it was dying. You know, they were going down and he's done a lot for them just by being there. And again, going back to Africa, Africa has been used as a brand to give us visibility it's not, a, that's not how it works. You can't, it's performative allyship. And I think that the notion of inclusion, it should be the other way. Non-Africans should be included in this because I don't see um, dyes coming from the global north or all the skill sets that's in Africa being homegrown in the global north. It's, it's the other way. We, we are the workers here because we're working behind Africa. The true artisans are in Africa. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really powerful. You, you said something else too, which I think is very interesting. You said that, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, these climate goals, uh, it has to happen by 2030 and, like you said, this is centuries and centuries long of colonialism, right? And so you said, it's not going to happen by 2030. Like, let's be realistic. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, you know, that's definitely a, I don't want to say fact, but I'm going to say it's definitely a fact because um, that people don't necessarily want to acknowledge, right? They want to say, especially these larger companies, they want to say, oh, we're working toward this, we're working toward this. And we kind of just buy into it and say, okay, but then we get the reports and it says, oh, we're we're not even on close to being on track. We're actually doing worse. Right. Um, and so with with everything that's happening with climate, with the world, and like you said, have 
you know, we're, we're probably not going to meet these goals by the time frame. If you had a crystal ball, no, because you, you, I know you can't predict the future, but what, what, um, just knowing this about the world, right. And just having this global perspective that you have, and you have a perspective, um, about, you know, politics and how, um, you know, everything is affecting each other. What do you see that's happening that maybe is shifting things? Um, because it's like the global North, like you mentioned, has a lot of control right now, but there's a lot of things happening where that control to me is starting to slip, right? There's a, you know, it's, it's almost as if the system is crumbling in a sense, because they're, they're really reaching for, um, how do we keep, how do we keep this alive? Or how do we keep these brands alive? Or, and people are starting to recognize like, oh, maybe I should, we should listen to this or, or, Hey, we don't need these big, you know, fashion houses to, to get our product out there. What are some of the, the shifts that you're seeing or what do you see the world kind of going to if we don't accomplish this by 2030 or when we don't accomplish <laughs> these things so, by 2030? I think the opportunity is in recognizing that thing that I was talking about is choosing not to choose. I mean, the pandemic taught us to be still and, you know, you, you couldn't buy, you couldn't get your dress in 24 hour you know express delivery or your cappuccino around the corner you just can't have it and I think that this this kind of FOMO of you know fear of missing out thing we need to strip that off our culture and maybe learn from Africa and other continents in the global south and see how they've done without being able to have two holidays a year and and have equal pay and women's rights and you know running water and you know and not that that you know it's all doom and gloom and awful I've I've seen the most beautiful architecture the most elegant of 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 events uh, that I've attended to have been in the global south not to sort of say that that is you know poor Africa is actually no it's the wealth of Africa I think the the world needs to pay attention and and understand that we have an educational problem and we need to shift our thought leaders from people who who have earned their stars and and stripes in institutions built on blood money frankly and shift it and learn from our elders and our wise men and women it's in the simplicity buying less at a very simple level I've certainly gone through that with the pandemic I was like just stop shopping like I just don't need more stuff and just living lean and realizing that this whole system is of making you feel like you need to more and more and then you this and you that and I need to be at this event and you know and so reducing our carbon footprint reducing the noise reducing this need to be seen this notion of a blue tick or a a queen's honor or whatever it is that we're needing to feel validated whether it's an acknowledgement from our neighbors of keeping up with the joneses or countries competing bidding for olympics we need to stop this thirst for the first and and we have it again going back to athletics and fashion you know the first designer that has done that the first architect that's built this the first athlete that you know the fastest man the, the fastest woman for what the richest man the Forbes ugh, it's just for what it's literally toxic and I think that uh removing that notion of the first is the best or the winner it is an, an, an uncolumbusing of our mindset and our culture and our education system. And going to Africa is our teacher going back to the classroom and learning that, you know, we are in the school of life of understanding that if I have more of something, it means that somebody else's child has got less. If I have a a t-shirt for the price of a cup of coffee, that means someone's daughter is sewing that for me and she should be at school or someone's son. And as a mother of two, I couldn't unsee my really good friend. 
she's the uh, founder of Fashion Revolution. And Ursula is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I've spoken with her in panels, um, but my favorite thing is watching her in events is that she's completely unbothered by how many Prada bags are around her or who arrived in what car. Like she, she will pro- sit and knit or, you know, in the corner in between her talks. And she's one of my most favorite people because she's over it. And I think once you get over the whole thing, then you can have perspective and then just really just ask like, what is, what is your intention? What is the point? Because the cloth itself, the fabric, apart from protecting our modesty and keeping us warm, everything else is just a vanity project. And that's the truth about fashion, sadly, but you know, (laughs) it's a vanity project and we need to stop. It's costing us too much. That's a lot to think about, right? Because you're... (laughs) I mean, it is, it's like, it's kind of changing your entire mindset um, when it comes to fashion and, you know, really recognizing that the impact that you can have just by making that choice of consuming less or not having to, to be in this race to be um, the best or the first person. And it's, I don't think it's taking away from fashion that, that it is like you're communicating with your actions, whether it's to not buy something or with what you do buy or who, or who you do support. So that's, that's really powerful. Thanks for listening to part two of our conversation with Sarah Ali. Stay tuned for part three, where we discuss sustainability as a way of life and the benefits of using Africa as our teacher. See you then. Thanks for listening to Fashion Futurist Podcast. Let's take back fashion together. Like, subscribe, and share as these small actions help to spread the word and make a collaborative impact. For more ways to get involved, join me, Camila Sanders, in the Fashion Futurist community by visiting fashionfuturist.io. Let's take action and accelerate fashion forward.